today. You've seen on the marketing that Jeff, early on in his career, he's been in the lab industry uh, all of his, his professional career. Um, early on, he couldn't find the right CAD CAM machine, so he built his own. He has built a company that is now, has been listed on the Inc. 5000, fastest growing companies for 2020. But more important than that for us, for LabStar, is that we've known him and worked with him and just become a friend over the past eight years. And he has consistently been one of those deep thinkers, someone who really wants to improve what he's doing. So this is really just a, a great opportunity to, to dive into that. So um, if we can jump in, uh, this is Jeff Hoffman. Welcome. Thank you for making some time. Thanks, maybe Jeff. We, yeah, thank you for having me. Maybe we can start with, uh, uh, how'd you get interested in the dental lab industry? You know, it goes back to right out of high school, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, right? And I wanted to be a dentist. And I had no idea why I wanted to be a dentist because it's not like it was in my blood. The only dentist I knew was my dentist and I didn't like going to the dentist. <laughs> but in, in a lot of ways, it was like pulling a career out, a career out of a hat. I, I, I wanted something that I had to work hard for something that I, I felt like some uh, people would respect me for. Um, and I was always interested in the medical industry and I always wanted to work with my hands. So I, I, I guess that's what led me to want to be a dentist, but I knew I didn't want to commit a lot of time, money and effort without having a clue what I was getting into. So I went and got a job at a uh, large uh, um, commercial lab and um, started off in shipping and receiving and, and about, six months I knew I was good at this. I knew that it interested me and, and that I loved it and that I could make a career out of it. So I just went, took a change in direction and stayed in the industry and, um, you know, can't say any, I can only say good things about this industry. It's, it's treated me really well. And it's, it's, it's checked those three boxes that I think most people are looking for in their careers. Right. Right. Well, but let's kind of dig into the meat of this stuff. Uh, you know, Nick and I have spent a bunch of time talking with you over, over a couple previous conversations about sort of your philosophy. And, you know, you've, you have this great deep experience in dental lab. You've worked at a couple different places. You've, you've been a co-owner and now you're, you're, you have your own lab. Um, one of the ways that you've described your laboratory is that it's a tech company overlaid on a lab. Can you kind of describe what that means? Well, it's actually reverse. I, I think a lot of uh, labs, they start off as a dental lab and they bring in technology to augment service and product. And I set out to start with the technology and then overlay a lab on top of that. And so our, our view has always been technology driven, not just technology augmenting what we do. So I, I have a saying, if we can't mill it or print it, we don't do it. And we live by that because we believe in the technology will get us to a more efficient, um, more consistent and ultimately scale to the size that we want to scale to and um, reduce the defects to the, the percentage we want. Um, so that's kind of what, what I mean by that, that we're, I, I feel like we're more of a technology company that happened to do lab work, even though obviously my background is in the dental lab and that's, that's what, that's why I, I, I slant the business direction. But um, yeah, we, we set out to build the tech company that just happens to do lab work is how I view it. So how does that relate to building your own CAD CAM machine? What was the circumstance behind that? Yes. Uh, uh, great question. Um, I started looking for solutions. Um, in my previous lab that I was a partner in uh, before I had them buy me out to go start my own lab, um, we were looking at different CNC machines at, at the time. And um, I just felt very limited by what the vendors or, or the uh, suppliers were telling me what I could do with it. And I, I, and, and I don't want to get into too long of a tangent, but I, you know, I, I grew up in, an, in a world where I had computers in my classroom in elementary school and then I get to middle school and now we have a typing class to learn how to type. But then the next 
semester, I'm doing word processing. And the reason why that's significant is, is I just always kind of grew up with that where technology started to infiltrate your life. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I had good fundamentals of analog, right. but I just expected digital to work a certain way. I just, I, I didn't like people telling me what I could do. I wanted to see what I could do, right? I wanted to see what was, was possible. And I looked at all the solutions, uh, you know, on the shelf and they, they felt limiting. So I said, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to make my own CAD CAM system, which was um, a lot more work than I thought. Um, I remember I took delivery on our, um, I have a crazy good memory. I know dates very well. Um, I took delivery on December 21st of 2009 of my first milling machine. It's a Haas milling machine and a forklift goes and drops it off in my garage at my house. And um, my wife uh, looked at me like, what's going on? And I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> I didn't tell her until just a couple years ago. I was sweating bullets from uh, December to about May because I could not repeat the same crown twice without uh, some type of defect. And mm. Yeah, it was a uh, kind of touch and go during that that um, that time. But but ultimately, the reason why why I chose that uh, to go that route is I wanted to I, I I guess see the potential of of what I could make with the tools that I chose. Uh, and and like one example is I I built a a custom fixture that had a 28 slots for Emacs CAD blocks. At the time you can find anything that could you know, run a job that large. Uh, that way I could set up overnight, walk away next morning, and I had 28 Emacs crowns ready to go. And if I went the other route, um, you know, I'd have to wake up in the middle of the night to go swap out um, the jobs. So it was trying to find the efficiencies and and um, try to just optimize what I could do with, with that technology. And I didn't feel like there was a solution on the shelf for me at that time. You know, you, you, you mentioned about efficiencies in your business and the way you're approaching it. You know, are, are you into lean manufacturing, Jeff? Is there, there's, uh, are there strategies? You know, what, what are the strategies behind this efficiency approach? Is there, is there a purpose to it? Is there a, uh, you know, is there a philosophy to it? Is there then a, like a brand to it that you apply? Yeah. So, um, lean manufacturing, if, if you spend much time around me, uh, it, even in my personal life, lean operations, I, I, I wish we were like 100% lean. We're working towards that, but that's a philosophy I strongly believe in. I, uh, in my personal life, I try to apply uh, lean principles. Efficiency comes down to, I, I, I take a look at um, waste, and I always have, uh, before I even understood lean principles, I just could see fat and and want to figure out a way to to remove and 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 find different ways of doing things Mm -hmm. um and i live my life that way too Uh, i certainly not perfect by any means um like to the point where when jeff approached me about doing this i really am careful what i do with my time and i say if it does not bring value to my lab i'm not going to do it but i love the um going off on a tangent a little bit here but but i i I love the idea of this wasn't going to be a tips and tricks uh, you know, tips, tricks, technique type um, conversation. This is going to be a philosophical conversation, which I think is lacking in the industry. Um, and, you know, if it wasn't about the, the and, and my relationship with Jeff and the fact that, it, that the platform was going to be for that discussion, I probably wouldn't do it because it wouldn't bring value to my customer. Mm. So, um, yeah, lean, lean is, we, we speak lean all day long here. You know, it's so, you know, it's so easy for people to talk about lean, right? And waste management and all this kind of stuff and being as efficient as possible and manage quote unquote from a spreadsheet, right? How do you blend that into this, you know, everybody on board, everybody enthused and, you know, you have a great empathy as well for the creative side of this business, right? From, from your his, history started at some of the most creative labs known right in, right. in the industry. So how, how do you blend that together no that that's a good question um it's really difficult because not everyone one believes in the concept two not everyone knows how to implement it 
And so I, I, I try to start with continuous improvement. You know, that, that, that's one of the, the principles of lean manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That is something people I think can relate to more organically versus mm -hmm. um, maybe some of the standardizing, some of the uh, identifying waste, I think is actually a really hard thing for people. You can identify certain waste really easy, but you know, there's the seven or eight forms of waste depending on who, who you talk to. Um, and there's some that are just so obvious, wasteful steps or, or whatnot. That's harder to get people on board with because they don't see the waste that way. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it, they kind of have to have that aha moment where they're, then they start seeing waste everywhere, right? Then, then you can't unsee it. Um, so I start with continuous improvement because they, they can understand continuous improvement okay. immediately. If they can't, they probably should have not passed that interview. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where we start with. It's a long road, especially when you're hiring people from other labs, which we like to hire people, honestly, that have not worked at a lab before. Because what we learned is it's really hard for them to see what we're trying to get them to see. Not, not impossible by any means. And, and, and we have people who have come from local labs that are just, uh, they, when, when they get it, they, they run with it. Now, if, if it, you know, you're going in this direction and does that require, I think a lot of labs think, boy, if I'm going to adopt this philosophy, I'm going to do lean, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do meetings upon meetings upon meetings. You know, is it just inbred into the, your, the, the lifestyle and the culture of the lab now? Did it, did it start that way? Did it take a lot of meetings to get there? Like, how did you get from where you were to where you are and kind of how are you going to get from where you are to where you want to be? you know, kind of this. Well, it, this, this it kind place. of started that way just because that's something I have always believed in. So that was in our foundation, but it's really easy once I started hiring employees to start losing sight of that because you get busy and, busy. and, and, yeah. and you're still, you know, you're trying to get production out of the door, but at the same time, you're trying to get this philosophy across and, and maintain a culture of that. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a little bit in our foundation, but as far as meetings and, and by, you know, you could take a lean guru, have them come in here and they, they'd walk away and, and, and tear us apart for, for saying we're lean. Um, because I don't know that the way that I want to operate is like, you know, uh, line for line matching lean. Okay. Um, we don't do a lot of meetings. I, meetings are so wasteful most of the time. And once you have a clear agenda, we try to only have one meeting a month. Okay. But really what it comes down to is you have to have kind of like that champion in your lab. For me, it, it's me, right? I, I live it. I believe in it. So, so I'm kind of a lean champion, but now we're starting to get other people who they see what we're, what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and so that's kind of like that, that continual improvement. You're con that's, that's daily. So maybe there's a bunch of these micro meetings that are taking place. Uh, but that's more on the floor, eye to eye level com conversations and not, hey, stop what you're doing. Let's get together, have a conversation. And you guys are going to, you know, absorb 20% of what I'm saying, because this is not the type of um, setting where a lot of learning is done. Mm -hmm. so, Interesting. I, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, yeah, thanks. So um, you want to integrate technology. You want to be able to adjust processes and get it learned right, by your team. Um, when we talked before, you talked about scalability for processes, because mm -hmm. it sounds like you're constantly, you're continually fine tuning these different processes. How do you get that, how do you, what do you mean by scalable? And how do you teach the whole team that? How do you get those ideas across? Well, once again, it's just this continual effort for that. But what I do is we do a lot of R and D with say a new uh, process, right? It may take maybe three months to come up with a new workflow for, you know, product a, um, that was working fine previously, but now we we're working on some, trying to work out some inefficiencies. Well, R and D the process, it's usually about a 90 day process. Um, and what we do is, what I, what I try to do is create this, this proven system or proven methods so that when I go and present it to the technicians who were part of, of that development process too, I think that's really important where they feel like they were helping build it. 
when you present and say, this is what we're going to do starting Monday, we're, we're, we're uh, switching over our production line to this new method. Um, once you already have that proof of concept in place, they buy into it a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. um, it does, it, it, it's slower in the sense that you have to kind of build out the, the front end and back end of it and prove it all the way through. Mm -hmm. But that's largely how, how we bring in some of those changes and, and addressing the scalability. Um, I have a very, I, I have a formula of our unit per head, uh, unit cap per head here that, um, Anytime I look at a new material, system, equipment, it has to match what my goal is for our um, unit per head. Um, if it doesn't, it doesn't, it usually won't get off the, the ground. So I, it, it, will, it probably won't even make it past our, my first initial look at it. Um, so those numbers that I come up with that allows me to say, okay, every time we have to add an employee in this department, I expect to have this type of production. And I know that I can scale this out almost in a modular form to 30 employees, 60 employees, hundred employees. Um, and that's kind of how I look at scalability. There's, there's three S's that I look for, and that is scalability, mm -hmm. um, simplification and standardization. If something that if, if, let's say a supplier brings a new material to me. Those are the three S's I measure it against. And if I feel like it's missing the potential for any of those, it probably is not going to make it out of that initial meeting. Right. Right. You shared really two interesting rules, right? Two interesting kind of def definitions of how your philosophy is applied. This kind of unit count per head, right? This measurement that seems like it's, pretty strong measurement for you and this three S's. Are there any others, Jeff, that you could share with us that and, and kind of your go-to philosophies, Jeff, if you yeah, want to- Can you hold on to that thought? Just that sure. We want to make sure there are some new people that have joined. And just to let everybody know, this is a, a conversation we're having with Jeff Hoffman of Method Dental Lab in Salt Lake City. And uh, we're talking with Jeff about his philosophy and approach to new technology, to building and optimizing workflows. And soon we're going to get to some other interesting things, including uh, client engagement. Um, but for now, this is Jeff Hoffman, and that's that's where we are. We're, we're... Jeff, welcome. please continue. <laughs> and Nick, can you maybe answer that question one more time? Sorry for yeah, that. yeah, welcome to all the newcomers. And uh, Jeff, you laid out some really interesting little uh, pearls right there, right? There's, there's, these, uh, there's these points of uh, intersection where your philosophies have definitions. And one of them is unit count per head. The other is this three S's, right? This, this is the filter that things have to go through. Are there some other key measurements that you use uh, in your lab that you could share with us? Um, On-time delivery, keeping track of, uh the percentage of on-time delivery, that's a, a critical metric. Um, in fact, we <clears throat> trying to figure out how to relate this all back. So the, the unit per head is an interesting thing because we strongly believe that quality and quantity is mutually exclusive. You can't choose one or over the other. You'll find labs that care about pushing numbers. You find labs that care about that extra brush stroke to make it look just right. And for me, I think there's a balance between the two. Um, so unit per head still has to be qualified against remakes, internal and external. Make sure that our defect rate is um, an acceptable range. And that we're also not trying to burn out employees, right? I don't, I, I think our record for most units pushed out by one stainless laser was 87 in one day. Um, we would never ask that of someone on a daily basis. That's just, we don't want to burn people out. We believe in work-life balance as well. I think that's important to you throughout. Is, uh, is there sort of an average target range? Because we have a question already in the Q&A. You know, what is your unit count per head goal generally? Or is that sort of flexible? Well, it, so it depends on department, obviously, because um, each product has a, um, and each step has a talk time. If you want to go back to lean, um, we don't call it talk time because people forget what that's called. Um, that's a, a, a lean uh, 
term. So we actually just call it product pace. And because each product has different paces, um, that number is going to change depending on department. So, oh, I mean, I have a bunch of, uh, of those numbers. I don't know that I could necessarily answer that in one solid answer, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. But you're How's flexible number? in how you apply that, right? Well, so, so a designer is going to have a different unit count than a scanner, mm -hmm. than, uh, than a finisher, right? So, um, and, and some of that's a little bit proprietary, but I would say that um, if you're not over 20 units on your finishing, you got to look at your system. Okay. So there's, there's kind of breakpoints where above this, this it's got to be kind of close to this number, whether it's above or below, that depends. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, to, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And then, you know, uh, I, I think a lot of people, at least I do, kind of think about this lean manufacturing and kind of the, the you know, if, uh, we have this thoughts about the creative side of the business. So, you know, lean kind of lends itself to a spreadsheet and then this creative side lends itself to creativity and intuition and all these things. Right. And you kind of mentioned this balance that you go for. Could you just expand on that a little bit? And is that hard? Is that easy? You know, do you, you know, how do, how do you do it? Very how do you hard, balance actually. that? How do you balance it? it it's very hard because some of it has to do with personality types, right? Um, for me, I've always been able to live in the creative and the analytical side. It's both appeals to me. I can do it, I think, pretty well, like, um, I, I can flip that switch pretty easy if I'm uh, right side, left side brain, uh, but not, not everyone does that. And um, yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge when you're dealing with a creative type and you're trying to also make them understand, you know, managing from a spreadsheet. Right. So what I try to do is um, <clears throat> if any of my employees are listing, I'm giving away a secret here. What I'm trying to do is actually make them buy into the creativity of building systems to kind of itch that scratch a little bit, right? Where, um, and, and, and I have to say not everyone buys into that because there's some people that it just, for whatever reason, it doesn't speak to them. But I have found ways to be able to present it where it feels like this is a creative process building something that you're not building something with a, you know, a, a brush, or a waxer, but you're building it with your your mind and paper and spreadsheets and building it out and um, trying to get them to be part of that process and see that that's still a creative process. It's just a new creative process. Mm -hmm. and when I first got into the industry, something that really appealed to me was the creativity. I, I wanted to to be a artist of some sort for my career, that uh, of some type for my career. Then I started realizing where the industry is going and saying that's not going to be around for my career. I got to find a way to, to um, itch that creative, uh, creativity scratch again. And um, what worked for me is I am, I, I think I've said this to you, I'm a potential person. I love potential. I try to find potential in people and products and my kids, sports, anything. I always trying to find potential. And um, so it, for me, it was easy to move over to system building or building businesses and find that my creative uh, outlet that way. So I try to kind of mimic that um, on the employee level. I want to follow up, but Jeff, do you have any questions? Jeff Knowles, do you have, because I want to follow up on that point, that creative, that potential person comment, it really is stuck. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, that's go with that one. Yeah, there's, this is sort of in that, that area of like spreadsheet versus intuition, creative versus yeah. system. Yeah. yeah, I've always recognized that in Jeff Knowles personally, that this potential person and I think back to many interactions I've had over the last 20 years with him and, you know, him creating these businesses and philosophies, whether it's a clinical business or his lab at the time or different softwares and, you know, looking at that technology platform as a creative process, right? Mm -hmm. So I've seen him do that live. And Jeff, when you said, Jeff, uh, when you said uh, you are a potential person, that stuck with me the last couple of nights. And I started to think, think, you know, do I cultivate myself as a potential person? And what does that mean? And if I'm not like you, what the hell am I? Am I a non-potential person? 
Like, what am I, <laughs> is it, like what's, so I, I mean, I really admire that in you that this, there's this optimistic side of yes. technology and growing and scalability and, and systems, right? So I don't know, I just wanted how it stuck with me. And I don't know if you want to comment more about that, but is this all these tools and lean, you look at it with an optimistic view and you present it thoughtfully to pay your, your lab in an optimistic way? You know, is that what you, is that what you're saying you try to, to do? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think my employees would, would back this up that I don't do anything. I don't, I don't bring in any products. I don't bring in any tools. I don't bring in anything into the lab, into their world, unless it's going to make their life better, make their job easier. Hmm. I mean, that's what tools and technology, technology is just a type of tool and tools are supposed to make the job easier, our lives easier. Um, so there's always, even if it's just that thread of optimism, it's always optimistic as far as our approach. This is always going to get us to the next step um, and try to find benefit for the employees and what the next step looks like, right? I, I, I'm very careful about making a change, but probably too careful. This is probably one of my, my weaknesses as a business owner is sometimes I, I, I sit on some great ideas because I'm afraid of disrupting this culture that I've built to, to where people, employees come in and tell me they love working here because it's such a, a, an open and creative uh, environment. But at the same time, we're serious about the work we do. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to maintain that. And I hope I can do that uh, as, as the company continues to grow. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, I think um, you, yeah, for me, you did. It's just that balance that I, I think in the daily work environment, right? It's, there's a lot of negative. We tend to focus on the thing that's wrong. Right, we do a hundred things in a day, right? We we spend most of our time in those ten wrong things, and then if we get tainted by those ten wrong things, our life looks like it's terrible, right? It's gonna every day it's coming to an end because we're focused on the wrong things, you know, the things that need to be fixed. Well, and and and, and our customers focus on the negative, right? We rarely right. hear when things are going well. And um, so what we try to do, and and I know a lot of labs do this too, is positive comment cards get put up on a bulletin board. So when we get that negative feedback, we know that's one out of a sea of many positive. Um, Interesting. Comments. So you try to frame that, that, uh, that negative comment and the things that are wrong in the context of all the, all the experiences. Right. Yep. It's just a drop in a bucket. It's not this, this flood of negativity. And, and we might go in this direction. I actually want to come back to the potential idea um, like Nick, I'm really fascinated by it. There's a fearlessness that that gives you in terms of taking on technology and processes and innovation. Um, you know, like everybody think about your mom and an iPhone, right? My mom is a very smart, bright person. She's a retired school teacher and the iPhone confounds her. She has no idea because she doesn't think of it as a tool. She thinks of it as an adversary. Um, you are the exact opposite of that. You talk about growing up with technology always present. It's just a, it's like reaching for the handpiece, right? It's just what it is for you. I do want to come back to that, but you've opened up another interesting set of questions about clients. Yeah, I, great, great question. Great direction. And, you know, you've talked about in terms of engaging with your clients, you get feedback from them and you collect that. Um, but when you first approach them, you've talked about sort of value over personal, if I, if I get that concept right. Can you explain what that means and how you approach your clients? Um, I'm trying to make sure that, that I understand the question. Uh, I, maybe, I, may, maybe I can layer on another, another, you know, here you're a technology company, right? Or you, you know, the technology company disguised as a laboratory. Right, and then you have all these lean processes, right? And, and yet, you know, how, how does that translate to the client experience, right? I, mm -hmm. I think, uh, is, it, is it cold and calculated? Is it warm and embracing? You know, what, how would you classify, you know, how you approach the, the, your marketplace? Well, I, I know people will probably disagree with what I, I'm about to say. It's worth for me, so for whatever it's worth. We, we have a saying here in the lab 
Um, we call it the purple crown theory. And what that is, is it's a pretty simple concept here that if we deliver a purple crown, i.e. if we forgot to crystallize an Emacs CAD once, which mm -hmm. has happened, and that's why this, this uh, kind of a bubbled up as a thing. If we deliver a purple crown, we're gonna get in on time, we're gonna get in less trouble than delivering a properly shaded crown late. So technology has to make, has to give us the, the opportunity to hit the due date every time. Our processes have to be built to hit the due date every time. That doesn't mean that we want to deliver purple crowns by any means, but we know that that is at least in our client uh, base and surveys we've done. That's always with the rank number one on time delivery. I don't want to reschedule my patient. I don't want to be in a situation where we think we have the crown and we don't have the crown and the patients in the chair. Um, that they value that over um, a lot of other things other things that we thought that they would value over it. One of the, the, the things that I thought that they, uh, in our survey, we thought price would be number one because it certainly feels like this conversations we get, we have a lot. Sure. Um, and it was important, but on-time delivery was number one and it consistently is number one. And consistently when we have accounts where things are going, let's say uh, it's a little bit bumpy, it's almost always because something has happened in, uh, as far as deliveries are, are concerned. Uh, in fact, uh, right before this meeting, I was talking with, um, with uh, a, an account specialist here, and she was telling me about this very thing with um, some accounts we have in the Great Lakes area. And it's, you know, they're, they're frustrated and it, it's not because of the work, it's not because of the price, it's not really about the communication, it's that there's something uh, broken in, in the, um, expectation of the turn time, which I won't get into the details, but it has to do with technology and, okay. and uh, how things have been sent off iOS. But um, yeah, we, so, so I, I, I don't think I'm answering Jeff's question at all there though. Yeah. Um, I, I have another question, so I'm going to yeah, yeah, get Nick, you even further yeah, off, tr off track. Maybe, you know, you, you, you know, it's interesting. You have this prioritization of what's important to clients, right? And you're going to hit that mark first and delivery time, certainly everything else is important, but that is certainly one of the measurements, you know, and also this just experience, right? You scale to get this delivery time, you bring in technology to do that. You know, did you see a need to scale not only your manufacturing, but also that frontward facing uh, account, account, uh, account people, account executives, whatever you may call them, customer care, yeah. You know, did, did you have to scale that to some sort of factor of your, of your client base, of your manufacturing base to be successful? Yeah. And, and, and I might be able to answer Jeff's question a little bit with, with this. Okay. Not too much, a little bit. Um, no, you, you can only have so many relationships, you know, effective relationships. Right. And so as, as, as you get to different thresholds, of growth, you're going to have to bring on more people just to manage those relationships. But what I, I view it as the relationships all wrong in the industry. And I want to have, and this is where people are going to disagree with me. And that is perfectly fine. I've, I've had debates in Chicago, you know, uh, over this, uh, you know, at midwinter. And that is, I think that our, that at least for our lab, a transactional relationship is better than a um, traditional lab dentist relationship. And that allows me to actually scale my customer service uh, at a different rate than everyone else because we're trying to qualify who does business with us. We're not gonna do business with someone just because they have a DDS or a DMD at the back of, at the end of their name. We're gonna do business with people who understand our value proposition. If they don't understand our value proposition, they're gonna be better off for another lab and that's fine. It doesn't hurt my feelings. They're gonna be in better hands, the other lab, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's going to do right by them, but that also helps us maintain this, this type of relationship. And I'm not trying to give Labstar uh, a plug here, but I'm going to give it a plug. We started pushing people to um, the web portal for customer service questions. And it starts by getting them to enter in their cases um, themselves through the web portal. Oh, okay. Because then they, that, that beginning step in the, the process they are already used to being on that web portal. Then we start saying, hey, did you know that you can answer these questions 
on web portal. And once they understand that, it reduces our phone calls pretty dramatically. Um, but there's still a need for human touch. There's still something beyond that. And really, I, I came up with this philosophy uh, many, uh, I don't know how many, several years ago, I was sitting here uh, in my office and my phone wouldn't stop dinging because someone kept coming to my door, uh, uh, to my porch and uh, ringing my doorbell. And, you know, I have one of those smart door, uh, um, uh, like a ring. And it, they, they wouldn't stop. I had like three people in like an hour. I'm like, what's going on? And it's all Amazon Prime. Like, and I started realizing my wife has a relationship with Amazon Prime, but she doesn't know a single person there. <laughs> and yeah, it's not the, it's not the exact, uh, you, you know, it, it's not a perfect parallel, but I started realizing that when you give people exactly what they expect, right. they can have that relationship with business and not the people in the business. Mm. And I think that's one of the hardest parts of scaling the business is building out that front end infrastructure. Um, I've been in large labs, you know, biggest labs, you know, you, you can ever go into and you look at their customer service department. And that's like the size of what most labs dream of being is just their customer service department. And while I'm not saying it's not valuable, I just think if you can change your relationship, you change how that has to scale. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And that's, uh, I love the analogy though. I, even though you might not, you say it's not perfect to Amazon prime, right? We pay that bill very quickly. Amazon prime. It's like part, it's a, it's our personal delivery service. Right. <laughs> right. And we don't complain about those guys. Right. Uh, we, we, and we're not taking them out for golfing. We're not, no, we're not for golfing, golfing and not right. cigars and maybe a bottle of scotch or something like mm -hmm. that. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a place and time for that with certain accounts. But I think if you're talking about scale, which that's, you know, goes back to my, my three S's scale, um, simplicity, um, and standardizing it, it actually, you know, touches all, all three of those S's. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's, there's times where wine and dining matter. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that that is our philosophy. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. And then just a quick question before we move on. Um, just where does this apply, you know, this relationship now and apply to some of this uh, ongoing client development and ongoing maybe marketing initiatives? You know, is it all born out of this same, uh, hey, we're going to share our value proposition. We're going to, we're looking to cultivate uh, more business within our business, our existing clients. We have a philosophy to gain new clients. Why have you grown, you know, every year for the last how many years? You know, wh wh where did that growth come from? Where, where did and, and what did you do to acquire it? You know, I think it goes back to the value proposition. I've always known what my value proposition is going to be before I even started this lab. When I was in in my previous lab. And I was trying to figure out if that lab could adopt that um, um, value proposition. And when I realized that lab couldn't for a number of reasons, and I said, I got to do it on my own. Um, the value proposition has allowed us to grow um, and continue growth. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly our performance has to play part in it, right? Uh, a value proposition is, you know, it's only that it's a proposition if you don't uh, uh, actually follow through with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I go back to McDonald's. Do you know McDonald's value proposition? We all do, but they don't go and plaster it on their um, marketing. They don't plaster it on their, um, you know, right. Their restaurant, right? But everyone knows what their value proposition is. And so that's how we, we get our value proposition out. We, in similar methods. Um, I'll tell you what, if there's one company worth studying and I've studied a lot is McDonald's. You can say what, what you want about McDonald's. You either like mm -hmm. them or you don't or whatever. But from an operational standpoint, phenomenal company. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, so I, I do draw on uh, some McDonald's uh, philosophies. As Great. Well. And, and then uh, I have a quick question. Just, you know, here, Labstar, right? Um, thank you, Jeff Knowles, for bringing this initiative together so we get some of the really creative minds sharing some of their thoughts and uh, hopefully everybody's enjoying it. I certainly am. But uh, uh, Jeff, do you use parts of the platform a certain way that you could share with everybody? 
you know, the software is there. There's a ton of tools. There's a ton of reporting devices. You know, what do you pull out of LabStar, right, that maybe you could give other users some tips on where to look and what reports to pull? Um, yeah, so we use a reporting system. The way our reporting system works, um, because we have certain type of information we're trying to convey to different people at different times, right? And um, so sometimes we have to partner two, um, two reports to get that information out to the people at the right time. Sometimes it is a companion report to our uh, one of our uh, spreadsheets. Um, as far as like our utilization, so many of the ways that we utilize it is actually pretty complex. It does not fall under the simplified um, philosophy. Um, that I, I I don't know that I could give a meaningful. Right. But I will say the web portal. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID is mm -hmm. a great opportunity to push that, to say, hey, if you can, because we've all received um, RXs that are drenched in something. And we don't know what it's drenched in, right? And um, I'd rather not receive contaminated um, prescriptions. So, you know, we, we started this campaign to try to, um, you know, huh. be a little bit safer because of COVID-19. And I mean, even if it's just a little bit safer, I, I think it's worth doing. And the, the um, kind of the additional uplift in that is that we also get them entering cases online, getting uh, more used to the web portal. We have fewer errors because they, uh, th there's certain fields they have to fill out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in, uh, kind of in that habit of, of interacting with the uh, web portal. So yeah. I, I would say that that's a utilization I would recommend to people is if you don't have people on a web portal or accounts on a web portal, you got to uh, figure out a way to get that adoption up. Awesome. We're going to jump in. We do have some Q&A that we want to finish the hour with. Um, and so some of these questions may be diving way deep into the operational and, and just for all the attendees, we've made it really uh, clear in all of our conversations, at least internally, that we're, we're less talking about operational metrics here and more about approach, philosophy, all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to throw them out. And Jeff, if this, if it doesn't sort of, we can sort of do the speed question uh, sort of format here. First one um, is, what do you view as a comfortable average for full contour design cases per day after scan or iOS is received? Um, they need to be doing somewhere in the 55 to 65, depending on um, their experience. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a comfortable number. Um, but yeah, that, that's strictly design. Yeah, okay. Um, you come back. Uh, the question. Great, a great to... question. Whoever yeah. asked that, that was uh, that's, everybody's looking for that balance. Yeah, yeah. And you're saying that, Jeff, right? With all the the background of quality and consistency and yet scalability, right? I mean, that's that's right. where that so, number is come. That that has all that cave those caveats. Yeah. So so we we have a chart in front of the designers, and it's a step by step what's supposed to be applied when and how. And so if they're following those, um, I think it's nine steps. If they're following those nine steps, they should be somewhere in that range. And we're making sure that they're applying the proper um, specs that are required to go to manufacturing. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, what kind of growth have you seen from point A to B in time with units, employees, and clients? Can you say that again? You cut out for one. That's right. What kind of growth have you seen from point A to B in time? Uh, units, employees, and growth. And I guess it's sort of choosing two, two spots. Has there been a, a particular kind of growth? Is it X percent or doubling your volume? Or is there a way to describe that? Yeah, um, yearly growth, year over year. You know, always I, I, would, I would also kind of say pre-COVID, post-COVID. Too. So, so if we're looking at growth, like company or company wide over, you know, any period of time, you know, I measure, I, I really like a, a six and 12 month rolling um, year over year, I think is important to understand 
what part of the cycle you're in, right? Um, you know, there, we, we all know the busy season, but I, we always forget that May is such a huge month for us. So we roll into May and we think we might be going into the summer uh, months and then, you know, it, it's important to be able to go back to realize, oh no, May is always a big month for us. So um, that's how I use my, my uh, year to date is more to check year over year. I really like the six and 12 month rolling. Um, and then checking employees, mm -hmm. what, what their average is. I know what every employee average is. Uh, they can walk into my office right now and I tell them exactly what they're averaging. Mm -hmm. I do like to watch that too, to see their personal growth, because if they're not at the high end of, or if, if they're not at peak performance, we need to find out why and help them get there. And, mm -hmm. and, and everyone's peak is a little bit different, but, um, so those are some of the, um, and I hope I'm answering that question. Yeah, I, I think if, if you, is there a, you know, if, if you were to pick a number that you're scaling your business to grow 5%, 2%, 1%, 10%, you know, what, is there a target in mind that you think you could, that is sustainable over time, this trajectory? Well, I know we, we hope for yeah. more, right? We, right, and yeah. sometimes we get less, but is there a trajectory that's, quote unquote, if you're investing like you are, you're always looking for improvement, that this is what it, you're, you're, you're hoping should be. So, so the interesting thing about the sustainability aspect is we don't know what the sustainability is because we are growing. So we have 10 years of, of growth. Every year we've grown, but we started to take growth serious about two years ago. Okay. So I only have two years of, of, of that growth. And right now I can tell you that um, what I think is sustainable might sound crazy to other people, but we're, we're in the 30% growth. Wow. So um, that's kind of my goal right now is I want to mm -hmm. see somewhere right around that 33%. Um, mm -hmm. And post COVID, uh, you know, uh, I, we're really thankful. I, we're one of the labs that um, definitely came back strong and we're, beyond those numbers. Wow, very, yeah, and then post-COVID, has your philosophy changed oh, no, hold at on. all? Could, Go ahead, we, Our questions are done, we gotta do Q&A, I think. Right? Darn it, right? darn it, I got more questions, <laughs> go ahead. We have so many more questions for you, Jeff. I, I keep on thinking of more, but uh, the attendees have, have uh, come up with some good ones. Next question, do you get pushback having clients enter their own cases? Um, yeah, we do because, because we, we all know that there's those, those, um, accounts that like to do what they've been doing for the last 15 years or, or whatever. But what we've, what we've noticed over the last five years, probably there's more and more, um, willing to adopt new digital process, if you will, especially with more and more iOS scanners out there. They're kind of being forced into that that um, ecosystem anyway. So um, yeah, we, we got pushback. COVID has been a nice little—I don't want to call it a tro Trojan horse, but it kind of has been they're able to get in there, uh, you know, and say, "Hey, we're doing it because of this," and and they've adopted it. And um, ultimately, I think one other thing is um, kind of a creative way to do it is if we have a sovereign account. We may say, hey, we're trying to maintain our, 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 our turnaround time. To maintain our turnaround time, we need you to enter in cases to reduce air and, and uh, bring cases in so that we can do some production planning. Um, so if you want to keep filling out a paper RX, there's probably going to be a place in the future where that may add one day of production. Mm -hmm. And um, that I pick and choose. That wouldn't be a blanket approach. It's to stone that I see that... Um, time turn time is important and they just can't get off the fence of of doing it so yeah i certainly have got got the push back but i would say post covid it's been a lot more successful okay so last question because we're coming towards the end of the hour one more point. i just want to make one more point about that no but with new accounts no new accounts get to use um prescription uh paper prescriptions anymore that's just how we operate interesting Last, last question. We have a couple minutes until about one more minute till the end of the hour. And we know people are super busy. We know people really want to engage with this, but everyone has their own deadline. So last question, what I'm going to do is there's three, the next three questions sort of have to do with the same thing. 
you talked about your value proposition is clear. Can you express what that value proposition is? That's a, that's a good question. I, I was anticipating one of you guys asking me that. Um, we have value, smarter, we have smarter viewers than the hosts. Um, is it really comes down to consistency. And what I mean by consistency is we want consistency in our delivery times, right? We want, when, when people use us, they know that they are going to get a case back on time every time. Consistency in what they see. RA2 is gonna look like RA2 that you got yesterday. It may not be the A2 that you want, and, and that's, that's okay with me. I mean, I, with that said, RA2s I think look like A2, but you know, everyone has a little different opinion. But as long as we're consistent with what the shade we're giving, the seat times, the, the turn time, consistency is important. And that is our value proposition is consistency. We, we our invoices are clear and concise and, and simple to understand what you're getting billed for. And we're consistent with that. So our, so our proposition is consistency and we know that our accounts appreciate that. When an account leaves us to try someone new for whatever reason, and they come back, they almost always cite it was a consistency. We just know what we're going to get with you. Right. Okay. Right. Right. That's very clear. I think, unfortunately, we've got to bring this to a close. Um, hey, Jeff, Jeff, before you do that, I'd yeah. like, and Jeff uh, Hoffman, amazing, really. Uh, so we've spent a little time already together, and I, I learned even more today, uh, really. I'm sorry that I got in the way and asked too many questions. We have really That's smart viewers question. that could have done a better job. But um, if we can end, Jeff Knowles, if you don't mind um, just sharing with uh, people what's coming next on uh, from LabStar. What okay, can we 30, expect? 30 seconds. Thanks, Nick. So um, in the next month, we're going to have a new case order and management system. By the end of November, by the end of October, it will be released to all users. We're, along with that, we are currently testing a three-shape integration. So kind of talking about what Jeff has mentioned, you're gonna be able to get a TRIO scan directly into your LabStar. You'll be able to enter a case in the LabStar and it'll show up in your three shape. So no more double entry. Um, awesome. And then we also have a mobile app for the lab coming up in November. And then in the beginning of next year, one for the doctor. So it's really about collaboration. So we have a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, before that, we also have our next webinar in conversation with Danny Sacker on October 7th. It's gonna be another fascinating conversation and he has his own unique take on what it is to build a successful dental lab. You know, what we've seen here today, uh, Jeff has been terrific about your consistency, the value proposition externally, the sort of the value proposition internally, your three S's, your scalability, simplification, standardization, uh, your ability to see potential in technology and innovation. These are all things that stand out about Method Dental Lab. And clearly, th these are drivers for your growth. And we congratulate you and we thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I, I should get an award for being a potential person now that I've been through your program. <laughs> like, I want to relabel all myself. Yeah. Thank you, you, Jeff. And now. And finally, uh, thanks to Nick Zara and obviously the LabStar team, but Nick, uh, we really appreciate your deep experience and your great questions. So uh, Nick and I will be back on the 7th uh, with Danny Sacker. And thanks so much again, Jeff Hoffman. Thanks guys. Good job, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Right, yeah. Bye. Bye.